By the way, if you want to be on the CCDC team, fill out this form. Uh, we will form a team and we will compete. There are, and even if you uh, do not have a, aren't a full-time student, it don't mean any requirements, you can still participate in some of these events which have no, no requirements. They're just not the official one that leads to prizes, but they have some sort of practice events called invitational that anybody can participate in. And, all right, so we're here in malware analysis. And so first, I've got this analyzing Windows programs, which I think we've really already covered a lot in the uh, projects. So it's going to be a function as a review. And then I want to tell you, show you some .NET projects, which are good fun. I learned about .NET entirely from the Flare VM, from the Flare, uh, Flare Contest, Flare CTF, which is still going on, Flare on. But um, anyway, it's a good thing to know. So let me get number seven, which is here, and put it in 126. All right. All right, so the Windows API, we've talked about a lot. Um, this, these are the libraries that contain the functions that Microsoft provides for you, and everything you do in a Windows program is essentially just a bunch of API calls, so we'll cover a few concepts in how it works. Um, it has its own names to represent C data types like D word for 32-bit integer and word for 16-bit integer because you can tell this uh, all dates from MS-DOS to the 16-bit operating system and anyway. Then there's something called Hungarian notation where they put a prefix on things, DW, uh, for double word if it's going to be a 32-bit unsigned integer. So you'll have word, D word, handle, and long pointer. These are things. Um, a handle is a reference to an object. If you open a file, you will get a handle, and then when you write to the file and close the file or anything, you have to refer to that handle. The same thing's true when you make open a window, and then there's a long pointer that's a pointer to a pointer. So handles are objects created to refer to objects while you're using them, windows, processes, menus, files. They're not pointers, but they are software objects that live in RAM that you can use to refer to something, and many, many pointers are created as programs run. Many functions create an object and return a pointer to the handle to the object, and you have to hold on to that handle in your program and use it to take actions on that object. So if you create window X, you get a handle to the window, and if you want to destroy the window later, you have to use that handle or anything else you might do with the window, maximize it, you know, send data to it, that sort of thing. And if you create a file, you can get a handle. Uh, so you create file, read and write. You can create file mapping and map view of file. This is a way to load a file into RAM and not used that commonly by legitimate programs, but often used by malware. And this is one way to execute a file without using the Windows loader. I made a bunch of malware in Python years ago that would go past antivirus because it put the malware in a data segment and then executed it separately without going through the normal load process, and that is not recognized by antivirus as an executable program. It's an old technique, and it still works. At least it still worked as of a few years ago. And then you can have shared files. This is Microsoft's sharing uh, notation, backslash, backslash, server, backslash, share, or even with this question mark here, which refers to another layer of uh, direct addressing. This is the equivalent of direct accessing a hard disk in Linux. And so this is the device namespace to have direct access to a device. And WYDIWORM, for example, it just wants to corrupt the entire hard disk. It would write directly to the whole physical disk, so it would hit everything like the partition table and all the control structures that you normally wouldn't hit if you write to a device like C or D. And that's what forensic tools do. They mount disks this way in order to copy every bit on the disk without going through the normal file structures that would only show you the active data. Alternate data streams is the only example I know of a Windows feature that was added to for compatibility with the Mac. The Mac was first with the multimedia, and they invented this alternate data stream so you could add cover art and outliner notes to music, and Microsoft has it too. So every file, you can treat it like a drive, put a colon, and put other files inside it, and you'll have multiple data streams in the file. So here, you put one in a file called foo, then you echo a long thing in a foo colon bar dot text. And now, 
if you do a directory of foo, it will tell you foo is only four bytes because the DIR command only sees the main data stream, not the alternate data stream, but there is an alternate data stream. You can open it by notepad foo colon bar, and there is a dir slash command that will show it. Forget what it is, dir slash n or something. Uh, all right, and we talked about the registry, although maybe not in this class, largely in the forensic classes. So uh, in the days of MS-DOS, it works more like Linux, where every program would have a text file with its settings. And these text files were just scattered all over the place. And there was once to start up a system like autoexec.bat and win.ini. And uh, around the time of Windows 95, Microsoft decided to gather all that stuff into one binary database called the registry, which is very strange. It's composed of about 12 files on a disk that are scattered all over the place, but it creates one object in RAM as you boot up and log in. And this has all your background and mouse preferences and start menu programs and all the settings for all the programs you put in there. And it's very useful for persistence. There are many registry keys, like the run keys, that will automatically launch programs on startup. So it's one of the many ways to make malware persistent so it'll survive a reboot. So the root keys have these names, H key classes root, H key current user, local machine users, and current config. And they are not really folders, and they're not really independent. This is a really bizarre, messed up structure. Um, every, these things are drawn like folders, but they are a database object, and they must always have a value. So if they have no value, they have to have a thing called default, but the value not set. And um, they're very strange, like um, current config is, I think, a pointer to part of local machine. Anyway, there's a couple, several of these. HT current user is just a pointer to a subset of users. They are not really five independent objects at all. It's a, it's a very strange structure. And so, all right, so you've got, these things are called keys, and there are sub keys inside them. Here's the value entry, and it has a data and a type of data. And you use regedit as the main tool for this. Um, all right, so there's the root keys. These are settings that are global to the local machine, which is a typical Microsoft way of talking. But the point is, it's applied to the local machine regardless of who's logged in, or indeed whether anybody has logged in. Then the current user can only be defined after you log in and you know who the current user is. Here's all the users, and one of them becomes the current user. Here's information about um, the connection between file name extensions and programs. This is where it knows that a DOC should open in WordPad or Microsoft Word or whatever you've got. And here's the current hardware configuration, um, which again is determined when you boot up. And so here's the run key. There's quite a few of them, but this is the simplest one. Microsoft Windows current run. Anything here will automatically run when a user logs on. So you see Adobe and the Dropbox helper and the log me in thing, various things are here. And you can put malware there too. Auto Runs is the sysinternals tool, which is now part of Microsoft. And this is the best tool to find out all the things that will automatically run. It's impossible to find them all. There are many, many ways to automatically launch, but it finds a lot of them. So executables, libraries that load, drivers in the kernel. It checks 25 or 30 registry locations. It's the best tool available to find things that are automatically starting, although there is an endless other ways to automatically launch things. And that's what Auto Runs looks like, showing all the various registry keys and the things that are launching on that machine. So you can control the registry with the Windows API. You can open a key, set a value, get a value, and so on. By the way, when you look at Microsoft documentation, it will often omit the trailing letter, W or A, uh, which is either for wide letters or ASCII letters. Um, when wide letters are these Microsoft 16-bit Unicode characters, which for English, are normal ASCII followed by a null byte after each letter, which is an old-fashioned, uh, not very good version of multi-language support, but it is the standard for Windows. And so that's the game here. So and you'll also see EX, which means extended from some earlier version. So you might see EX and A and EX and W at the end of a, of a uh, Windows API call. So here's regex, reg open key, extended wide, and here's reg set value, extended wide, and so on. So here's an example of code that modifies the registry. And you can export reg files. You can right click any part of the registry in regedit and export it as a reg file. And this is an easy way to record settings or to create files that will change settings. And all that creates is a simple plain text file that lists all these. You save it as a reg, reg file. And the reg file is just a very simple text file. 
and you can record registry and you can run this like a program and it will put those keys in the registry. So this is one way to make registry changes. You really don't want to ever send an end user in to do this because you can mess up the registry and your machine will be destroyed and it won't boot. I heard of a story one guy that, where a guy was worried about malware so he went to the root hives and set them all to read only. And if you do that, your machine will not boot. It has to be able to write in there. there and, you can, and any changes you make in here have immediate effect. There's no undo, there's no save. You can wreck your machine in a hurry in here, so you don't want normal users to go in here. So if you wanted to push out a registry change, and there are common ones, like for example, Microsoft often has a service pack. I remember this happened to Windows XP and Windows 2000. They'd have a major service pack that people were afraid would break everything. And they were gonna push it out through Windows Update, and they wanted to tell other machines not to put on that service pack. And so you had to change a registry key, so what you do is you go to one machine, and then you make one of these reg files, and you give them the reg file. You say, double click on that and that will make the change. That way you don't open regedit and wander around and get lost. Um, that's one of the many uses of those reg files. So let's take a look at a Kahoot. Oh, of course, these, that's pretty old techniques there. The modern technique, of course, is to, whatever you want to do, just push it out from the domain controller and execute it automatically from the domain controller. Don't ask the end user to do anything in a Windows domain. That's the best way to handle that sort of thing. And this is, whoa, I'm somewhere messed up. Favorites? There we are. Uh, this is 126.7a. Forever. Well, there you go. Good attitude for people in this class. Because it's all about Windows. All right. I'll give it a few more seconds. Pointer to an object. Yep, that's a handle. Good. I'm not sure a handle is really a pointer. I think this might not be exactly right, but anyway, it's a, it's a reference to an object. Anyway. All right, a second stream of data in a file. Alternate data stream, good. All right, which one is the root key? Yeah, HP current user. One of the root keys. And which one is the sys internals tool? Right. And 
know who that is. I don't know who that is. to here. All right, so the networking APIs are the calls used to network, and these are based on Berkeley sockets, which are what define the internet. Defined at UC Berkeley, these are the fundamental sockets that define TCP IP, and they're mostly in WS232.del. They're just duplicating the Berkeley standard sockets that were originally for Unix and have gone everywhere. These are the standard things. You create a socket object with socket, you bind to listen on a port, uh, this attaches to a port, then you listen for data, accept a connection, you can connect to a remote server, and then you can receive and send. And these are just the standard routines. You'll find them in Python and every other language. If you, These are what's called raw sockets. So on the server side, you have to create an object, bind, listen, and accept, then send and receive. On the client side, you create a socket and then connect, and then send and receive. And so you'll see a server program It'll do WSA startup, which is what it does to prepare the library for use, and then create a socket, bind, listen, and accept some data. This is like the server side. And the realistic, properly written code would keep on calling get last error to check for errors at every step so it wouldn't just crash if anything goes wrong, which of course it often does when networking. All right, the WinINet API is the main one people use. Raw sockets are just too irritating. You have to do nonsense like hey, manually program the handshake and crazy things like that. WinINet has a nice high-level function like internet open, internet read file, we'll just download a whole file, taking care of the handshake and error detection and correction and everything. This is what normal programmers use, this high-level library, where you just have single statements to do a whole network connection. All right, so jump and call, move to another part of the code, but there are many other ways to do it. You can jump into libraries, launch processes, threads, use mutexes, services, com objects, and exceptions. These are all ways to introduce new code to be run. And so DILs, of course, are the libraries. We talked about them a lot. You've made some libraries to hijack execution. Um, they export, they export um, entry points, which you can jump into from other um, applications. In the old days, static libraries were used. In the old days of Linux, and I'm not sure they ever used on Windows, but they were used on Linux until fairly recently where you just have your own copy of every library in every executable. So you have two executables that use the internet. They would both have in their own copy of the network library. So you had a malware developer skip WinINet and do it themselves? Yes, often they will. Hey, Corinne, it's a very good question. Um, so malware developers are the main people that would use raw sockets. Um, they won't always use raw sockets, but they might very well do that in order to uh, confuse the developer and in order to use some strange network protocol that is not a standard one. So you can have libraries. Um, if you use static libraries, they can't share memory among running processes, and that, of course, uses more RAM and takes more time to load, as you have to load a fresh copy of the library for every program. So almost no operating system does it that way anymore. In the interest of efficiency, they use dynamic linking. And so, uh, all right, you, you can have custom DILs. There are some famous Firefox DILs, and a lot of software comes with DILs, but most of the time, you prefer to use the standard Windows DILs because they're there and you don't want to redo the work unless you have to. So malware authors can store malicious code in a DIL. They can, and they're also going to use Windows libraries to get anything done, and they may also use third-party DILs. And they often, as you've seen, trick innocent processes into accidentally loading the wrong DIL to inject their code into another process. So DILs are just like EXEs. There's just a single flag that indicates it's a DIL, and then the format is the same, but of course, an EXE only has one export, which is the entry point, start or main. Now, normal DILs have many entry points because there's many functions they offer. And they're going to have to have DIL main as the main function, and this is called when you load or unload the library. This prepares it for use. As soon as you load the DIL, it immediately runs whatever's in DIL main to prepare it for use. Every program is a process. And every process has its own memory space. We've seen them in all eDebug. You have their own memory segments for every process, their own handles, their own memory segments. And each process then has threads. And the threads are parts of the code that can move forward independently. So if one thread is waiting for something, the other threads can keep moving um, if you write multi-threaded code. So uh, all right, newer malware tends to execute its code by injecting it into another process. 
or a dill injection or a technique like that. And you go to task manager, you'll see there are many processes running, something like 100 on every Windows machine these days. So each process has resources, CPU, memory. It, it, the operating system gives each process some memory to use. And if two processes are accessing the same memory address, that's a virtual address. For example, all executables think they're running at 400,000 in RAM, but that's a virtual address. They're really motored to other locations, and these days, random locations with address-based layout randomization, but internally, they think they're at 400,000. It's a virtual address space. So you can create a process, and there's a startup info parameter that will tell you things like what you're going to use for input, output, and error streams for that process. So this can be useful to create a remote shell. You'll launch a process and connect its input and output to a network socket, and now you've got it taking data and sending data off to the internet. So here's code to create a shell, call socket handle, um, and then you call LP startup information and load a bunch of stuff, and then you're going to call a... Um, so this loads socket handle, standard error, stand put output. That's what this stuff is. Standard error, stand put output, standard input. So this is going to create a socket that goes to the normal um, locations. Okay. So that's defining them. It looks like it's defining them all to be the same, which doesn't quite make sense, but anyway. Um, all right, and then you go down here and create the process after you've loaded up all the parameters. And you define the command line too, which is the command line executed to launch the process, which will be the name of a program and its parameters. All right, so processes like container that has one or more threads, and threads are what actually executes. Each thread is the one that the CPU gets, each thread gets some CPU cycles, and then it strobes to the next thread, and the next thread, and the next thread. And uh, threads share the same memory space, but they have their own registers and stack. And so that's called the thread context. While one thread is running, it controls the CPU, and um, it can change a register and it won't affect any other threads. So when it stops this thread and moves to another thread, it's called a context switch, and it has to store that data in the thread context. So you create a thread here with a start address, and uh, you can therefore use create thread to load a malicious dill, then create two threads, one for input and one for output, to communicate, the sort of thing you can do. And then you can make mutexes. Mutexes are things like handles that just sit in the memory system and in the RAM, and they are visible to other processes. And this is the way you communicate with another process. If you make them in the kernel, they're called mutants. And they often have hard-coded names. Malware often uses them to mark a box saying that it's infected. So if the infection agent is run again, it will know not to bother trying to infect this box again. And if it's a fixed hard-coded name, then that's a handy indicator of compromise you can use to tell that that machine is infected. So you can wait for a single object. This will give a thread access to the mutex and tell any other threads they have to wait. You can release the mutex, you can create a mutex, and open a mutex, and your various processes can check to see if that mutex is there. And so here's open mutex, which will then check to see if it has, if it matches this name, HLGHEL48. And if not, it will create it with create mutex. So this is uh, malware marking your box with that mutex to indicate that it's infected. All right, let's try another Kahoot, 7B. Oh, Halloween's over. Go back to the normal music. Windows had an AI to get, but it won't be long. Everything's getting AI on it. GitHub has AI, right? They're code assistant.
Yeah, yeah GitHub Autopilot, that's it. I haven't tried that. People tell me I should try it. They say it's really, really works well. So which library has bind and accept? That's it, WS232, WinSock they call it, Windows Sockets, standard Berkeley standard sockets. Which library contains internet read file? Yeah, that's it. The one with the friendly name that gives you internet functions that are easily usable. All right. So what type of file differs from an EXE by one flag value? <coughs> yep, libraries are very close to EXEs. All right, a global object used to coordinate multiple processes. And in the language of Microsoft, global on the local system. Mutex. All right. All right. All right. New winner so far. All right. Now it's supposed to be one play. Good for you, honey. All right. So, should be able to keep going. Yeah, we're not too late yet. All right. So, services. The services run in the background and provide um, functions to other programs that are running, and Microsoft Windows has something like 75 or 100 of these things running in the background on a typical system. So they typically run as system because they usually launch before you log in, so they can't run as any as normal user, um, and they usually run automatically in Windows Start. So sticking your malware in a service is another handy way to make it be persistent and survive reboot. There are API functions. SCI Manager will give you a handle to the Service Control Manager, and you can then create a service or start a service. So you can specify whether it will start automatically at boot, boot time. And you can, um, the most common type of service is a share process, which means it will actually share the same executable with other processes. And that's what SVC host is. Most services are running in instances of SVC host. If you look in Process Explorer, you'll see a whole bunch of these SVC hosts. And if you hover over one of them, it will show you all the services it's running. This one here is the window manager and the distributed link tracking client and the network connections and many other things. And that's why they call it share. Typically, one executable will launch a bunch of these services and another will launch another bunch. And most of the services are SVC hosts launching. You can also have own process. This will run as an EXE and an independent process not shared. And you can have kernel drivers which run in the kernel with kernel privileges, and any piece of hardware has to have a kernel driver like your printer and everything else. So you'll find them I in the registry. Here's the services in the services key and current control set, and they have a start value for various purposes, like 20 for share process, 3 for load on demand, and so on. So that's this one. That should be the um, start value. Here it is. This start value is 3, so that's load on demand. And there's the type, type 20. So this is load on demand and shared process. A lot of them do not start until you are required by something else. Even though there might be 100 services, they're usually not all running on a Windows system. A bunch of them load only when you need them. 
SC command is a command line command to do this stuff directly. What's the definition of a service? Well, a service is a process that runs in the background. It doesn't do anything user can see. It's used by a program to support it. So uh, it's different than a DIL. A DIL, for example, is attached to a running executable. A service is just running in the background, listening for requests. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, all right, so SC is the command line command to do this. You can run SC and you can do a lot of things like you can query about the browser process and it will tell you all that information from the registry about the browser process. You can also create services, start them, stop them, and launch them with the SC command. Uh, usually you have to have administrator rights to do that. The component object model is another way to reuse code I don't really know why it exists. It seems to overlap with dills and services, but it's another way to accomplish essentially the same thing. So you have, um, you can create some code and put it in a com object, and then programs can use the same com object. And Microsoft did this so you can sell your code to make money. So you call Olay initialize for object linking and embedding, I think, and then co-initialize before it starts, one of these, and then you can call com library. So these are objects that are available for use, and you refer to them by these globally unique identifiers, which of course, since it's a Microsoft term, it always means the opposite of what it is. It's the same on every machine. They're not unique at all. Um, but anyway, class identifiers are here, and there are interface identifiers here. Those are GUIDs. They're, by the way, the same, the 128 bits long, expressed in hexadecimal, the same size as IP version 6 addresses. So you have these com object things that are sort of like services or dills, but technically are a little different inside. Um, a lot of them are insecure too. Um, they, they dated from about the Windows 98 time and a bunch of them are poorly written and, and persist. Anyway, then there's exceptions of course. If your program does something illegal, like it tries to execute a kernel command without kernel privileges, or it tries to divide by zero, or it tries to jump to a memory location which is not available for your process, then you have an exception. And that triggers a special condition where the program stops executing instructions in order, and it goes to the exception handler to find out what should I do when an exception happens. And so that is in the uh, registry F, the register F0, stores where the exceptions are. So the, you'll have a, um, it's called a segment register, and you'll go there when there's an exception. And I've seen that before in some of the projects you now in the excuse, in exploit development class, we make SEH exploits, not in here. But anyway, um, it's that's what it is. You have a chance to handle exceptions within your own code, and if you don't, then it will go to the default exception handler, which is the operating system, which will just pop up some kind of box and say your program has died. If you have an exception in a kernel routine, the machine stops and you get the blue screen of death. It cannot recover from that. But if it's in user land, then it will just close that one process and tell you the process has died. All right. And that gets us to kernel mode. The hardware supports four modes, ring zero for kernel, ring three for user land, and there are two intermediate modes which are not used by any modern operating system. There was a very old operating system called Minix that actually used all four, but nobody in the modern, and no modern operating system uses anything other than ring zero and ring three. In fact, they now use ring minus one, which is hardware assisted virtualization. They've added some stuff below there to give virtual machines direct access to the kernel. But anyway, um, this is the original model, and as you probably learn by now, everything you learn, there are exceptions, because somebody invents a new thing, like you learn the difference between layer two and layer three in the OSI, and then they got VLANs that are in between. Everybody always breaks the rules to make new features. But that's the basic rule. So um, user mode is where everything you launch is. Your start button, everything on your desktop, everything in your command prompt, even the administrator command prompt, all that stuff is running in user mode. And that's where almost everything runs, and therefore it can't touch the hardware at all. All it can do is call kernel routines to please touch the hardware for me. And uh, that's the idea. You only manipulate hardware by going through the Windows API. Which is why I say all programs are ultimately just a bunch of calls to the API. That's the only way anything actually gets done. Although you can write your own kernel driver. You go with the hardware, and then so that has to be installed when you install it, and that goes in the kernel. So you can't add code to the kernel for that reason, and that's how kernel mode rootkits can get in there. So each process has its own memory and its own permissions and resources. We've seen this. You'll see them in separate lines in Ollie Debug. Um, if the user mode program crashes, Windows can terminate the program and let the rest of those programs keep running. 
because uh, user land processes are separated from the heart of the operating system, which is the kernel. You cannot jump directly from user mode to the kernel. What you do is you execute one of these a syscall. Syscall, syscenter, or int 2e are all the same thing. They call specific um, kernel calls, and you have um, uh, labels to which call you're making. And essentially, that's what all the uh, built-in libraries are doing, is making those kernel calls. So kernel processes, they all share resources. They are not separated from each other. And this is very bizarre. This is why there's a, I made a lot of noise a few years ago when I found an IP version 6 flood that would kill the kernel. And I couldn't believe it when I learned this. If you just use up too much resources in the kernel, the machine dies at the blue screen of death. Kernel processes are not separate. They don't know how much memory is left. They just launch and hope. It's incredible. And they say they have to do that for performance reasons. I was very surprised at how sloppy things are in the kernel, but they really are. Anyway, uh, so if anything goes, anything goes wrong in the kernel, you're just dead. And therefore, if you want to debug the kernel, you really have to have two machines connected and a master slave to do that, as we talked about before. And antivirus software and firewalls and kernel mode rootkits run in kernel mode, which is all really bad for Microsoft. And they tried for a long time to end all that because that's why iPhones are more secure. iPhones, nobody can mess with the kernel but Apple. And you can't have any hardware. You just get the official Apple hardware. It's only running on official hardware, so they control it, so they know what should be in the kernel. So nobody can put a rootkit in there, because during boot up it checks to see if the signature of the kernel matches the real certificate and it won't start otherwise. And Microsoft tried to do that with their ARM tablet. But um, they never succeeded, and they even got sued by uh, one of the antivirus companies saying, if you lock us out of the kernel, you're destroying our product. And uh, so the way we are now, other people keep putting stuff in the kernel, so Microsoft cannot validate it because they really don't know what should be in the kernel. But it's getting a lot more difficult to get rootkits these days. It's not as common as it used to be. Anyway, so you can put malware in kernel mode, and of course, um, that's the most powerful. There are user mode rootkits, but kernel mode rootkits are even more powerful. They're harder to write, and they're not that common. But once you get them, they're hard to detect and hard to remove. And then there's the native API. Uh, this is a low-level interface that normally only a malicious program would use. And here's how it works. Your user application is out here. What you're supposed to do is load kernel32.dil, which has the friendly name. And these are the kernel functions you use. And that will then call ntdil. And the ntdil will then jump to kernel mode with those uh, syscalls and go to NTOS kernel, which is in kernel mode. And that will go to data structures like drivers that, that do things. This is the normal flow for a normal application. And, but what you can do is you can use the native API, ntdil, which is undocumented, and it's supposed to be for Microsoft internal use only. But as we saw, you can just use WinDebug and read the machine language and read the assembly and see what it does or get an ex-Windows programmer to leak the information to you and you get these original native API calls. And of course, they're more powerful because everything kernel 32 does, it does by calling the native API. So this is where all the action really is. So if you want to write malware, you often just ignore that and jump straight to ntdil. And that will often stop some security programs that are hooking these calls. And it will make it harder for people to understand your code. You know, it's the sort of thing like raw sockets that you might do. Most malware does not use kernel mode, but almost all rootkits do. Well, I've heard of rootkits both sides, and I haven't seen any recent documentation on how many rootkits there are of each kind. Uh, but, but yeah, um, I think a user land malware is by far more common. But I haven't, I'm not sure whether it's any more true that kernel mode rootkits are rare, but I think it is true because Microsoft has been getting stricter and stricter, and stricter about drivers. Uh, modern versions of Windows actually require the drivers to be uh, signed by Microsoft more and more, especially on server versions of the operating system. So they're really trying hard to keep junk out of the kernel. And so I... Uh, it's a good question, and I don't really know the answer. I'm not up on the latest statistics of whether kernel or user mode rootkits are more common these days. And so here's the kind of things you'll find in malware, NT query system information, information thread, information key. These are fundamental, low-level things that give you a lot of information about running processes and, uh, of course, not documented, but you can figure out what they do. And uh, then there's NT continue. This will return from an exception. So this can be used to trigger an exception, return from an exception, and go somewhere, and that's a way to confuse an analyst, where you jump to some other code and it's hard for them to find. So those are some of the native API calls that you might see in malware. So let's try another Kahoot, 7C. Good, right on time.
used to have rootkit homework in this class back in the days of XP. But in modern versions of Windows, it's very hard to write that homework, very hard to get it in. So uh, certainly rootkits are much more hard, much harder to write than they used to be. I couldn't find any to put in my projects for the last several years. They've become a very advanced topic. I think they're still out there, but uh, they're not easy. They don't fit in this kind of project too well. Blue skein of rebirth, there you go. Microsoft tried to change it red, and they tried to do things to decorate it at one time. And I, then I think somebody said, you know, customers are really not supposed to see this. You should stop messing around with it. There was a time when there were a lot of something going around saying Microsoft is going to put ads on the blue screen of death, but I think that was just a joke. That was that would be awesome though. We sure saw it a lot in the days of Windows 95 and 98. Those would die all the time. You don't see it that often anymore. All right. So a user account more powerful than the administrator. Windows 90, Windows 98 first edition would crash after every two hours of use of the screen of death. That's why they had to put autosave in Microsoft Office. It would just die. It had a memory leak. It would self-destruct. Anyway, that system is the more powerful account. There are other ones like uh, Trusted Installer, but system is the most powerful one. And what kind of service loads Ring Zero code? Where's the native API? NGDIL, that's it. And we divide by zero, what happens? Structured exception handle. All right. All right. That's two time win. And we're moving on. And we're home. One every time. Very good. And for once, I know who everybody is today. So that's good. All right. So uh, let's take a 10 minute break and pick up at 7.05, and then I'm going to demonstrate some of this .NET stuff. So I'm going to unfavorite these to get them out of my way. All right, we're done with that. And so I'll be back. And achieve compliance before going out and offending people.
have a CO2 monitor. Uh, check the air is very fresh in here. That's why it's so cold. So in this room, it's really very safe even without a mask. Out in the hallway, it probably is, but I don't know. But the main thing is other people will get mad. Other, some of the other teachers are very nervous about it. Uh, after I got COVID from teaching in a stuffy room, I went and got one of these meters, which is pretty awesome. Anything below 1,000 is very safe. Oh, what is it? It's like 531. Outside is like 480. So this room is basically as fresh as being outside. Wow. That's why I'm okay to teach in here without a mask. Oh, wow. Even if this room was had a lot of people in it, it would probably be okay. But especially with only two or three of us, it's, it's very safe in here. Right? Very unlikely to get anything. I'm glad of it because you know I don't think I make these videos very well with a mask. Mm. I'd have to do something stupid like go to another room and say that remotely or something anyway. Or an office, yeah. What's that? Or an office? Yeah, I could do something like that, but that kind of defeats the purpose of having people show up physically. Yeah. You know, I think I think you make better contact with people if they actually show up physically. Like for the last. All the people that never come in except online, I don't even know who they are, what they look like or anything. So, I mean, it's, I understand that they, uh, it's better for a lot of them because they don't want to commute or anything, but it does mean that I don't really get to know them very much. So, yeah. I know you've been in a lot of my classes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's your name? Alex. Alex, okay. Yeah, thank you. I hope you don't get offended. I'm real bad with names. Oh, no, no. If, they, if they were numbers, I'd be okay. <laughs> but names don't stick in my head. Yeah. I assume uh, if I was younger, they would have called me uh, Asperger's or something, you know. Didn't have these words when I was young, but I never could handle people, just computers and math and stuff. I really, I, with people's names, I dump them immediately. I know. Other people pick them up. Like, when, even when I'm reading a newspaper article, I'll get halfway down and I'll refer to a name, and I have to hunt back because I don't even notice the names. Yeah. And I say, who is this guy? But other people, they notice names. And I'm just not oriented that way, you know. It's... That's yeah. why I say I got this. I like math and numbers and nice square things, mm -hmm. but names are the kind of information that just means nothing to me. It's like, it's like, uh, I feel like names are more chaotic than it's ordinary. Yeah, I remember when I went to grad, when I went to undergrad school, people said, "Gee, math and physics is hard. I want to do um, like biology and geology." And I said, "That's hard. There's all these random stuff. There's no pattern." Like in physics, all you need to know is F equals MA. That's it. You can figure it out. I love that. A nice, simple pattern. Yeah, there's always transformations and yeah. mutations and stuff. And but they found it easier to memorize, like, the name of 100 rocks uh, or flowers or something. And I found that very difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's like um, there's, like, a sort of an anchor that they use in order to find the solution faster. But, yeah. but with, with numbers, it's like... Static is not going to Yeah, I know, yeah. Hey, oh, I see a question, yes. Is there extra credit for doing NCL? Yeah, sure. i got to figure out how to do it. But um, I think NCL does give you some kind of score, right? Um, I'm a pretty miserable coach, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, but but it, it, NCL? NCL is a National Cyber League. It's like a CTF, but it's actually at the right level, not too hard. So, yeah, um, it's definitely worth extra credit. If you can, make like a screen print of something showing your score. Yeah, you know, good. If you have some kind of score, then I'll, uh, I'll try and figure out how to convert that to something. But sure, you guys should totally get extra credit for that. That's a perfectly fine thing to do. Also, CCDC and CPTC, any of these contests, um, they're all very good for you. So I'll try and uh, figure out how many points to give you. Yeah. yeah. But it, they're definitely good, and you should... Uh, you I, should I wanted yeah. to tell you that um, because of taking your classes, um, Facebook... I, I applied for Facebook and um, I did the audition they do, where they give you a website and you have to like find out how to find the find the keys and everything. Find what? The find the keys. The keys. Yeah. So they, oh. it's like it's like it's like your it's like, like a CTF. Your, yeah, yeah. It's a, all the flags basically. Oh, good. So I did that and I remember your classes and um, I know your training. And I use your website to cross check to see like okay, I don't remember that stuff. Um, but yeah, I got in, and I got the internship, but then I quit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but well, that's good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Stuff helps. Yeah, good. it does help a lot, yeah. I, yeah. I, I love it because um, I, I don't like the management, I don't like the people, and I don't like the, um, I don't like the way things are structured. You know, they really want you to be all the time. And well, I've, I've heard it's really miserable now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Twitter is really miserable now, too. So the, uh, the bloom has gone off the rose for a lot of these tech companies. 
I think Google is still pretty nice, although not as nice as it used to be. Now, all the companies are stock is falling, they're squeezing people. Meta is destroying itself now. I mean, they're, they're, they're killing themselves off like Kanye West with just bad decisions. And, uh, and people are screaming about it. Well, but, he, but he was right. Adidas had so much money. It was like 15% of their whole product line was tied in him. So it was really, they lost a lot of money doing that. He was probably right saying they would never cancel me because it would hurt the company so bad. But he made himself so toxic that they decided to take that hit. And the, uh, but yeah, it's, and the thing is, you know, I don't understand what he said that's much different than what Trump said, actually. And they love Trump, and they, I mean, I, I think they should both get canceled, but it doesn't really make sense to treat him as like 100 times worse than Trump. Trump He's above the law. I know, my parents, no, but the thing is, on a scale of like racism and bigotry, Trump is like a seven and Kanye is like a nine. It's not like zero to 10, not at all. <laughs> He's only a little more blatant about it than Trump. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's, well he keeps bragging about now he's off his meds. That's his latest thing. He said, the Jewish doctors are poisoning me, making me take those meds. Now I quit taking the meds, everything is so much better. You know, that's yeah. what a lot of these people that need meds say. Yeah, that's what people that need the meds say. And obviously he's one of the guys that needs the meds. Yeah. Holy cow, he lost billions of dollars in just a week. That's not a, no, it's about one it's not that much. Yeah, I think it's a lot. <laughs> 1.5, he is now like 400, right? So it's like a little bit over 1 billion. That's it. Yeah, he fell from being a billionaire. Yeah, he was, he was like a billionaire, now he's not. And it's Facebook. Only one. It's only 1 billion. Yeah, but 1 billion. I mean, 1 billion sounds like a lot of money to me. I don't have any $1 billion. <laughs> anyway. Um, you got to rap like him, man. That's true. If I rap like him, <laughs> I, but I, I don't think that's an option at this point. I think I'll just continue. I've learned how to live without a... Yeah, yeah. I think you can do it because there's a guy that used on AI science in order to create an avatar that does that crap captures all the music and then packages it up and then it outputs it. It's really, really cool that with the way you use the whole database in order to create. Uh, uh, well, it also used a, a little bit of AI in order to find prediction, a prediction model about what the, the trend of music is going. So. Cool. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'm going to do the, uh, the um, .NET projects, and I'm able to do them in Windows 11. I tried it out, so this is cool. Windows 11 on this ARM processor. They Are warned you. you. What's that? Are you on the M1? I'm on the M1. Oh, okay. And that's why this is not VMware. This is, you have to use this stuff called UTM, is the virtualization software, and you can run the Windows 11 ARM edition. Oh, wow. That's what I got here. It's like a, a pre-beta, uh -huh. and uh, not everything works. And they warn you, the Visual Studio, they say, we don't recommend it, it might run slow. It seems to be okay, though. Uh -huh. So this is uh, like a beta on a beta. <laughs> but uh, it's working for quite a few things. The only thing is, of course, you can't do any like disassembly. You'll see ARM assembler. Uh -huh. So. Uh, but anyway, I tried it uh, earlier today, and I'm able to do these .NET projects, which makes sense because .NET is really high level. It shouldn't really care what kind of processor there is as long as the underlying OS is there. And uh, this developer beta version of Windows 11 seems to have everything that's necessary. It does take a long time to start up, though. But it runs OK once it gets going. Yeah. Oh, really? Seems not to play nicely with Twitch. Well, now, can you? There was a few projects that didn't work on my um, VM. Um, I go, go native, Windows 11. Um. Oh, that's interesting. In this class, yeah, especially because yeah. you're going to, yeah. Now, uh, Karen says, the Windows 11 machine does not play nicely with Twitch. Uh, do you mean that you can't see it on Twitch when I'm using it? Or are you trying to do it, something with it at home? Let me check my. I gotta echo that Twitch stream. Now it looks like it's showing up okay. If let if uh, if you go and tell me a little more about what the problem is, I'm interested, Karen. Getting some amount of blurriness now and then. That's usually just a matter of adjusting your uh, your settings at that end, refreshing your end or something. Because here I got a lot of bandwidth. So uh, 
My signal should be pretty high quality from OBS. Yeah, it's showing nice and green. As soon as I started it, it gained intermittent consecutiveness issues. Oh, that's it. Oh, it might be burdening my processor a bit to start it. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Twitch is freezing and jittery. Hmm, huh, that's disturbing. Um, hmm. Well, it might just be that it's using resources. Uh, yeah, I mean, it looks okay on my echo. Well, well, let me know how it's going, and I'll see what happens. Um, I could go back to my cloud machine if necessary. Hmm, freezing and jittery, huh? Well, now I should have, oh, let me uh, put in power. It might be just running low on power. That might be what's doing it. Because VMs do suck a lot of power. Mm. And my battery's running low, so I should do this anyway. I appreciate you telling me, because I don't have any way to know what you are seeing. And uh, it's only by you telling me when there are problems that I know. Okay, now it's got power. Maybe that will help. Now it's okay. It was probably the boot up process. Yeah, yeah. I, during 